from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. We're pleased to have as our guest for this program a man who's been a friend of mine for decades, Mike Hammond. And uh, although Mike is himself a modest man, it's fair to <laughs> say that uh, in all of the years that I've been involved in public policy in the vicinity of Washington, D.C., I've never known of a more brilliant, effective uh, legislative strategist than Mike Hammond. Uh, whatever victories conservatives have achieved on Capitol Hill in the last few decades can be traced uh, to the brilliant insights and uh, strategic leadership of Mike Hammond. One of the regrets of my life is that when Mike ran for the U.S. House of Representatives from New Hampshire, uh, the supposedly conservative Manchester Union leader undercut his candidacy and denied us a man who would have been the most effective uh, conservative in the U.S. House of Representatives. But Mike has stayed in the fight over the years, and uh, one of the things you've done, Mike, is serve as an advisor to Congressman Ron Paul, if I am yes. correct. Now, Informal advisor. Yes, unpaid, as usual. Uh, the Ron Paul campaign has been remarkable in attracting countless thousands of people uh, to political involvement who had not been there before. Uh, the question is, what happens now? What's, Ron is not at all likely to win the Republican presidential or vice presidential nomination. Uh, what do you think his future ought be, and uh, what can be done to permanently integrate his followers uh, in the uh, cause of liberty? Well, one of the uh, charms and great liabilities of Ron Paul's followers is they're not going to follow my advice, even when it mattered, much less when it doesn't matter. And so I, I, I can, uh, as, as Dante said, uh, uh, speak my mind without fear of ill repute. Uh, but I, I, think, I think Ron Paul, first of all, has enough money that he's going to go through the February 5th primaries and see how they turn out. At the very beginning of this process, and, and let me say that I was the chairman of Pat Buchanan's New Hampshire campaign in 1996 when we won the New Hampshire primary. And so I'm not completely ignorant with respect to presidential politics. And at the outset, I advised Paul of two things. First of all, there was going to come a time during the uh, presidential primary season in which the field would be in play. And at the time, at that time, I think people thought the McCain nomination was inexorable and Hillary Clinton was an inexorability and subsequently that Giuliani was an inexorability. But lo and behold, there came a time in which candidates who up until then had been thought of as inconsequential had a shot at the brass ring. The second thing I said is that particularly given the field of front runners, which existed at that time, there would be a real gap for a conservative, a person running as a conservative. And in fact, there was. And I am afraid to some extent that uh, uh, former Arkansas Governor Huckabee has sort of gotten into that vacuum. Uh, and that Ron Paul has run a somewhat different campaign for a somewhat different constituency, although I think he could legitimately have run as the conservative candidate, and I think he should have. Uh, what happens now? Well, I think, first of all, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich was not my favorite person in the world, but he did one thing right. He did one thing which was better than, I think, any recent major conservative, quote unquote, politician, and that was he knew that you needed to have an agenda, an agenda with volatility, an agenda that scared the other side, an agenda which uh, was capable of propelling your people into office and propelling the other side off out of office. And I think that's what we need right now. 
we need an agenda, and we need at least a single senator who's willing to do what it takes to carry out that agenda. And I think that is, at this point, although I, you know, have, have every hope that Ron Paul will do better on February 5th than I think he probably is going to do, uh, I think at that point that's the future of the small government movement. Two questions. Uh, is it possible or even likely that Ron Paul, having taken stands which go against the Bush stream of the Republican Party, may lose his congressional seat in Texas? And part B, uh, assuming he holds his seat, does he have any chance, realistically, of being elected to the U.S. Senate from Texas? Uh, probably no and no. So in other words, he won't lose his seat and he won't be elected to the Senate? I, my, uh, I don't know Texas politics that well, but I, I suspect that I, my understanding is that the machine, as it were, in Texas is going, uh, which worked at one point very hard to ensure that Ron Paul didn't get elected to Congress, is also going to work very hard to ensure that he doesn't get elected to the Senate. But that, that's just my speculation. That's certainly far, far outside my area of expertise. And we could, if it were to happen, take Senator Ron Paul and save the country. So if it were possible for him to become a senator, why would that make a difference? Why, why would he make more with, of a difference with than Tom the, Coburn? With the Senate rules being what they are, a single senator who does the right thing uh, can basically run the country. Uh, I don't think Coburn's the best example. Jim DeMint may be the best example so far this year. Even though DeMint has questionable policies he, on trade. he's been chairman of the Senate Steering Committee. But he started out by killing the $463 billion continuing resolution, knocking, uh, basically knocking all the earmarks out of it, almost killing the ethics lobbying bill, forcing the grassroots lobbying out of it, killing free sta uh, any freestanding resolution dealing with the Iraq crisis, and, and just right down the line. It, it's incredible yeah. when you look I, at I it. I agree. That Demint, Demint has run the Senate, even to a greater extent. Demint has Reed. been a very good senator. Uh, prior to his election, I was concerned about his policies on trade. He supported Fast Track. Uh, he supported uh, PNTR, Permanent uh, Normal Trade Relations with Red China. But I have to agree with you, he's done a magnificent job as a member of the Senate. Now, putting aside for the moment what you said mm -hmm. about Ron Paul's followers, leading them is like herding cats. Uh, if you it's were a in, coin a phrase. It's a coin of phrase. Uh, if you were in a position to herd those cats, uh, what would you do with them? Well, we have, uh, Ron Paul has the Liberty Committee, and he has a mechanism now which is capable of generating a lot of money and generating a lot of support for ideas. I would channel that computer mechanism he has uh, on behalf of an, of an agenda. Now, uh, a man whom I greatly respect uh, suggested that what we need to do is take the Kasten plan and train as many of the Ron Paul people who want to be trained in the Kasten plan and get them uh, to uh, organize at the uh, district level uh, to take over party structures. Do you think that's a mistake? Uh, I think it's um, uh, taking over party structures, whether that's doable or not doable, I don't know. I know that a lot of us worked very hard to take the Republican Party and turn it into a conservative party. And for the time being, uh, the Bush administration is making that uh, a very speculative enterprise. But I, I do think it's important to get a few people in there, a few people to the position where they can do some good, give them an agenda, at least give them a staffer who knows the rules of the United States Senate. I mean, that's what, that's what you need. You need to understand the parliamentary procedure because with the Senate, you can, you can do anything that way. In the old days, we had Jim Allen and his student, Jesse Helms, who were able to do things with it. Well, let's, let's look at the immigration amnesty bill. It was a bill that basically had a majority of the Senate in favor of it, 
a majority of the House in favor of it, the Bush administration in favor of it, and they were pushing very hard. What killed it? Well, grassroots. I, I, certainly, I cer certainly don't want to diminish the great work of grassroots. What killed it is we created a parliamentary structure in which, in order to buy off the votes they needed to invoke cloture, they just had to go through a series of amendments, and we prevented them from getting to the amendment they needed to buy off the votes. Mike, we have to take a break. When we come back, there are other very important issues that uh, Mike Hammond will address. Specifically, I'm going to refer back to his comment about our need to have an agenda around which people can rally, and I'm going to ask him what would be in that agenda. Please stay with us. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Come on, you're going to tell me that buying one imported towel is going to cost someone their job? Ever tried shopping for clothes with a four-year-old? can't be looking for where the stuff is made. Since 1980, nearly half a million Americans who make apparel and home fashions have lost their jobs, even though the quality of our products is second to none, which makes you wonder if it's foreign competition that's hurting us. So the shirt's imported. Who's it going to hurt? Or if it's us that's hurting us. Buy American and Americans work. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable, and our guest is Mike Hammond. Mike is a longtime strategist on Capitol Hill for conservative causes, something like 18 years. And uh, he, if his advice had been followed whenever it was given, uh, this country would be in far better condition uh, than it now is. Mike, you mentioned that one of the things that was good about Gingrich was that he recognized the need for an agenda. Yes. What should be our agenda? Well, uh, at least four things come immediately to mind. Thing one, abortion. I mean, we've been treading water on that a, lo a long time. We're now uh, uh, patting ourselves on the back because only 850,000 babies are killed every year. And what a grand achievement that is. You know, I, I think if we could do one thing to end abortion, it would be to create, and Ron Paul won't love this probably, but a federal cause of action whereby any woman can sue an abortionist for the physical, mental, or emotional damage done to her by that abortionist and create all sorts of incentives, legal fees, uh, treble damages, and right down the line for those suits to occur. If we can put the Dalcon shield out of business, I think we can put abortion out of business the same way. And, you know, we've had that language around for 20 years now, and we've frittered around the edges, and, and I, I've certainly played a major role in that, but we haven't done the fundamental things we need to end this genocidal tragedy of abortion in our times. Number two. Number two, guns. And I think this is going to be uh, the agenda of And God. by the way, uh, readers or listeners and viewers should know 
uh, that you're a consultant to what is probably the best Second Amendment organization in America, led by our friend Larry Pratt, Gun Owners of America. Yeah. The major objective of that organization is going to do, be this year is to take the 140,000 Iraq veterans, people who have engaged in honorable service, who have sought help as a result of the traumatic incidents they saw in Iraq, have sought help with the Veterans Administration, and as a result have had their right to keep and bear arms stripped from them. And gun owners frequently was, without any notification. Gun whatsoever. owners was the only organization that fought against that. Absolutely. Even the national or even the even, National Rifle Association was on the wrong side of that issue. It's disgusting, it's immoral uh, for you to take 140,000 veterans, guys who have served our country honorably in Iraq and say, well, we're going to reward you as a result of your uh, trauma which you suffered there, we're going to reward you by treating you like a criminal, by taking away all of your gun rights, and by, incidentally, if you inadvertently keep a gun without knowing that you're a prohib prohibited person, we're going to make you a felon, arrest you, and imprison you. I mean, is there anything more disgusting, more contemptible than that? Number three. Number three. Uh, China. Uh, it, and uh, I, I should give you a little background to this. Uh, we were talking during the break about some of my good friends, Dave Sullivan, Quentin Cromlin, at Margot Carlisle, and so on and so forth. One of the things, and Mike Pillsbury, one of the things we did during the 1980s particularly was to fund various movements behind the Iron Curtain to fight this scourge of communism. And incidentally, if, if you're looking for the uh, single most genocidal regime in all of human history. Uh, don't look to Joseph Stalin. Don't look to uh, Adolf Hitler. Look to communist China. It's killed more people genocidally than any regime in human history. And yet we are cozying so, up to so it. So you don't think it's a good idea for George Bush? And we are pumping Bush. money into it. And I, I, I mean, you don't even have to finish that sentence. You don't think it's a good idea for George Bush? The answer is inexorably no. I mean, Bush. But whatever, whatever you're going to finish that sentence with, the answer is no. Well, I mean, I'm not a fan of FDR, but at least he did not sit next to Adolf Hitler at the 1936 Olympics. George Bush will sit next to Hu Jintao, the communist Chinese boss. Uh, at the uh, Red Chinese Olympics. One of the things, one of the things I did, uh, well, I did several things. First of all, I drafted the legislation which created radio uh, and TV marti. Secondly, I drafted the Sims Amendment, which kept the um, kept the uh, uh, Reagan administration from selling out the Mujahideen. Although you certainly wouldn't know it from watching uh, recent films in that area. It, it should be Mike Hammond's war, well, not Charlie Wilson's. Okay, I don't take ahead. that credit for right. it. But, that, but the film did act as though the, <laughs> the Congress were a unicameral legislature. But the third thing we did is we drafted legislation rebuilding uh, the Solidarity Trade Union in Poland. And not, uh, not every conservative thought that was a good idea. And there are some people who almost hit me uh, uh, over as a, as a result. But I said, and as Vestia quoted me as saying, as a matter of fact, quoted me correctly, as saying we viewed uh, solidarity as our contras. What would happen is we would build up solidarity, they would overthrow their government, and as soon as the other countries in Eastern Europe saw that that could be done with impunity, they would all overthrow their governments too. Everyone thought, that is ridiculous, that is stupid, that is a fairy tale that will never happen. But lo and behold, it did. We should be doing the same thing in Cuba. We should be doing the same thing in China. Should be doing the same thing in North Korea and, frankly, Vietnam as well. How in heaven's name have we reached the point in which we have taken the successors to a regime more genocidal than Hitler's and, and turned them into our good economic trading partners? You mean Vietnam? Well, uh, no, I'm talking about communist China, China in this case. but. I, I, you know, I, I throw Vietnam into that classification. Well. But John McCain vouches for them. Oh well, in that case, uh, <laughs> I, I and I know what a high opinion you have of John McCain, and so I, I'll defer to your your advocacy of his candidacy. I do not support John McCain. For those of you who are watching, I disagree <laughs> with him on just about, well, on many things, including 
amnesty, McCain fine gold, etc. But uh, because my cabinet is a friend, I will not take offense. Did you did, well? Did you see yesterday that um, <laughs> in, in, in yesterday's Washington Post that he said, no doubt of you and of me as well. He call, uh, his um, uh, longtime assistant uh, John Weaver said of us that we were self-anointed conservative leaders serving special interests. Special interests, I assume, are the unborn guns, the family, the Constitution, and things like that. And it's not a pain. And that the reason we didn't like, well, it certainly doesn't pay very well. <laughs> and that the reason we didn't like John McCain was that he, he, rather than serving these special interests, such as the Constitution, served the national interest. And that we would, uh, and according to Charlie Black, that we would rapidly fall on board with his candidacy as soon as he began <coughs> to win, because, of course, winning is the greatest palliative. Now, did you see that the Washington Times did a piece about all of the Reaganites who are now supporting John McCain? Reaganites like George Schultz and Larry Eagleburger. No, the answer is I didn't see that. I only read conservative newspapers. Uh huh. Well, you must have a very short part of your calendar devoted mm. to reading. Not very much. <laughs> Uh, uh, the fourth. Yeah, the rest of your agenda. I'd do something to reduce the size of government, perhaps uh, automatic sunsetting, perhaps automatic auditing, uh, uh, perhaps reinstating the hold in the United States Senate so senators could place it on legislation. We're, when I was a boy, the federal government was $100 billion, half of it military. Probably in the next year, it'll go up to $3 trillion, 30 times what it was when I was a kid. And There's the something fundamentally wrong with that. You know, we talk about Ronald Reagan in the Kingdom of the Blind, the one-eyed man is king, but the national debt tripled under Ronald Reagan. And it's gone up 60%, and the budget has gone up 60% under George Bush and Republican control. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, Mike Hammond will have some closing vignettes for you to consider. Stay with us. One of the top leaders in the communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible and uh, as a result of the extra money they have they're not only taking jobs from the United States they're increasing their military budget by 17 percent a year it's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China the conservative caucus www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626 Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. More than the entire population of Cincinnati. More than all the men and women in the Marine Corps. More than four times the number of unemployed auto workers. Since 1980, over half a million Americans who make clothing and home fashions have lost their jobs because we don't realize the impact of buying imported goods. So if you think looking for the Made in the USA label doesn't matter, next, it matters. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips. And uh, if you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, as sponsored by the Conservative Caucus, <coughs> you can check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. Uh, you can fax us at 703-281-4108, or you can drop us a note at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Mike, you really know a great deal about uh, the real government of the United States, how it really operates. 
Yeah, I probably do. And you're a student of history. In your opinion, who are the five worst presidents in American history and the five best? Oh, I think you could probably take uh, recent history and draw all of the five worst. Um, How I, recent? Uh, fairly recently. I mean, it's, it's sort of indicative that federal government, as I said in the last segment, has increased 30-fold in the last 40 or 45 years. And uh, our, all of our problems are a lot okay, worse. In the top five, let me guess if you would have these in. George Washington, number one, no, 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 two, no, no, no. three, oh, the, four, oh, the good and ones, five. The good ones. But the bad oh, ones. Oh, you're talking about the top five worst. The five worst. You would certainly agree that Abe Lincoln is one of them. Well, Abe Lincoln was my relative, actually. On, on the but, So, uh, I don't know. Blood may be thicker than water here. All right. What about Woodrow Wilson? Uh, Woodrow Wilson certainly uh, certainly has internationalist policies uh, didn't do us any good. But F I can tell you, no president prior to 1963 has, has spent so much money, right. so fundamentally transformed the federal government for no good purpose F whatsoever. FDR, LBJ. And incidentally, that three trillion is just illusory. We have trillions and trillions of dollars of Mike, funded debt we can never we're, repay. We're out of time. There's so much more we can learn from you. But thanks for sharing thank you, Howard. this time with us. And thank you for sitting in on this conversation. Stay with us. Thank you.